Hello and welcome to Canada for this special edition of Talking Europe. Yes, indeed, we're at the other side of the Atlantic this week for one of our agricultural specials. We're looking at the EU-Canada trade deal and the possible impact it may have on food and farming. The deal took almost a decade to put in place and has raised concerns amongst farmers on both sides of the ocean. Across in the EU, they fear an oversupply of Canadian pork and beef as quotas for both increased thanks to the deal, while here in Canada, it it's dairy hands that are concerned about the possible impact EU cheese could have here. So is there really anything to fear? Well, we're going to meet with ministers and producers on both sides of the story to find out a bit more. And we start by heading to the Canadian capital of Ottawa to meet with its trade minister, François-Philippe Champagne. Mr. Champagne, thanks so much for your time. So this Canada-EU trade deal, the EU, 500 million people here in Canada, 36 million, a very big deal then for Canada. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, for both nations. I mean, uh, this is the most progressive trade agreement ever negotiated by Canada or the European Union. Um, this is the agreement which contains elements to protect workers' rights, the environment, cultural diversity, the right of states to regulate. And this is the agreement which we hope, obviously, will bring more choices, better prices for consumers on both sides of the Atlantic. Of course, in this show, we're looking at the agricultural element of that deal. Do you think that's an important part of the deal? Well, definitely. I mean, you know, if you look at consumers, uh, let me give you an example. You take about seafood and fishes from Canada. Today, when they come to Europe, uh, they have a duty of about 25%. So on day one of provisional application, we know that 9,000 tariff lines are going to come down to zero. So lobster will come for consumers in Europe at zero tariff line. On the other end, we will be able to import cheeses, for example, from Europe, which, you know, will provide, this is about choices for consumers. This is about opening up, making sure that on both sides of the Atlantic, we can benefit from the great products we produce on both sides. It's starting to rain. Do you want to go inside? We've now come inside the Canadian Parliament, Mr. Champagne. You say it's putting consumers first and foremost, but a lot of farmers, indeed, on both sides of the Atlantic, have expressed some fears across in Europe. They feel that we might be inundated with Canadian beef and pork. The quotas for such have gone up over 10% for both uh, due to this deal 75,000 tons of extra pork, 50,000 tons of extra beef. What does that mean for Canadians? How significant is that? Well, I mean, it's diversity of products. I mean, for example, you talk about meat products. We're going to be able to export bison in Europe, which, you know, I hope consumers in Europe will find a new taste for bison, which is very, which is very healthy. What we're doing is opening up these markets. It's creating opportunities for farmers. You know, there are challenges, but you have to look at the opportunities. Well, actually, our reporter Luke Brown went to meet with some meat producers here in Canada to see what kind of impact they think this deal will have on their livelihoods. Jason Hagel is a 21st century cowboy. He raises 5,000 head of cattle here in Alberta. Two-thirds of his livestock is fed growth hormones and aimed at the domestic market. The rest is known as natural. It's ready to be exported to the EU. With cattle for two different markets side by side in separate pens, it's vital to ensure there's no mix-up. Um, but with the EU market, you have to individually know the traceability of it, every individual animal right from the ranch to the feedlot, to the packing plant. So I was uh, quite surprised on it. In all, he's invested $200,000 to access the EU market over the past decade. To meet the EU's stringent demands, every step of the food chain is tightly watched. The feed transported in two trucks to avoid contamination. Which also feeds the for the If the feed gets contaminated and it, and it gets into, a, into the wrong pen, uh, into a EU uh, pen or, or a natural pen, it's, uh, we need to take that whole pen off the program. You know, it could be a $200 to $250 loss on, on, per animal. The tight restrictions means producing for Europe is more expensive. That's why the beef slated for export is marketed as higher quality premium cuts. Here we have a uh, rib eye, or the uh, rib, full rib of the uh, of Canadian AAA beef. Uh, beautiful bright red color. Uh, this would be a premium product suitable for export to the EU. The CETA deal will remove tariffs for 50,000 tonnes of Canadian beef. 
amid European concerns that growth hormones will make it into the food chain, the Canadians have to reassure their potential customers. For any product that qualifies for the European Union, we, we have an additional 14 laboratories across the country that monitor uh, to ensure that the product qualifies for the market it's being exported to. Alberta produces almost 70% of Canadian beef. But in 2016, Canada exported less than 500 tonnes to the EU, a fraction of what the CETA deal will allow. Only a few dozen of Canada's 70,000 cattle operations are ready to make the most of access to the European market. It would likely be about five years before we would be in a position to, to send um, larger quantities of beef to the EU from Canada. One of the EU-ready farms is the Shoestring Ranch. Ian Murray has been based here for a decade. In front of us here, we've got a calf that looks like is, is probably only an hour or two old. He must have just been born. There are no growth hormones or antibiotics here, a personal choice for Ian that opens the door to Europe. Our production practices have mimicked the requirements of the EU protocol very easily um, based on the way that we have been producing cattle for a number of years. But Ian Murray is an exception amongst Canadian farmers. It means he's ideally placed to benefit from the CETA deal. I'm happy and proud that there are very few producers in Canada producing beef uh, to be exported to Europe currently. Uh, my hope is that with uh, the full implementation of CETA, it will become more widespread and that there will be other beef producers uh, that can modify their current management enough to decide that uh, targeting the European market uh, is a fit for their operation going forward. While Ian Murray may already be eyeing the European market, his Canadian colleagues still have their work cut out to really benefit from the opportunities created by the CETA deal. OK, so we got there a glimpse of what Canadian farmers think of this deal. Uh, now, one thing we do have in Canada is these genetically modified products. They're one of the world's biggest producers of them how do you think that will be controlled when going to the European market? Should it be labelled more? What, what's the issue? Well, I mean, there's discussions between both sides. By having an agreement like CETA, actually, this is a good thing because then we're bringing a number of tables together for people to talk to each other. Um, well, of course, uh, there was one region of one country in the EU that actually still isn't completely convinced about this deal. It's Wallonia in Belgium. Do you think the deal is now a done deal? The CETA agreement was voted... Uh, with an overwhelming majority in, uh, in Strasbourg. Um, I think now what we need to do is, like the Prime Minister say, is make trade real for people. Provisional application in just a few weeks, we'll have 9,000 tariff lines, which are coming down to zero. And this is gonna mean real benefit for consumers, for workers, for small and medium-sized businesses. When you look from that lens, you realize that this was the right deal at the right time. Um, one thing, of course, that we're expecting to be much cheaper for Europeans is a very emblematic project here in Canada. It's maple syrup. 8% uh, trade tariff will be slashed off of that. But I believe the biggest consumer over in the EU of that is uh, the United Kingdom. They voted for Brexit. If they leave, uh, will that be a problem for this deal? Well, you know, I, I've been very clear. Uh, the UK will have a trade agreement, a free trade agreement with Canada. It's called CETA. And we have been very clear about that. We know that uh, uh, the UK government is committed to ratify the agreement in, uh, in their parliament. So they will have a, a free trade agreement with Canada. OK, Mr. Champagne, it's been a pleasure meeting with you. We're actually going to head now to a cooperative of maple syrup producers to find out what they think. Over 36 million litres of maple syrup are produced in Canada every year. 80% of the world's output, a sizeable amount of it passes through this co-op of 2,000 producers. Most of what is being bottled and packaged here goes abroad, 60% to neighbouring US, but over 8% to Germany and almost 5% to the UK. For those latter consumers, the EU-Canada trade deal means import taxes on the sugary substance disappears. Well, it's a very important drop. Uh, we talk about 8% in maple syrup. Uh, what we uh, expect to have, it's with a, a decrease, an expected decrease of price, uh, people will try the real maple syrup and will like it. Real maple syrup is the pure kind, undiluted and unmixed. It's made on farms like this one by sugar makers like Claw. 
Maple syrup comes from the sap of the maple tree. It drops into the blue tubes we've tapped into the bark. The tubes are linked to a pump that brings the sap into the main cabin. There it goes through a process of reverse osmosis, which means that some of the water, the non-sugary part, is removed. The sugary water is then boiled down to syrup. It takes about 40 litres of sap to make one litre of syrup. Quebec is already the world's maple capital, but locals say they're ready to make more should demand increase. To find out how likely that is, we're joined by Maurice Doyon, Professor of Agricultural Economics at the University of Ottawa. Mr Doyon, uh, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Uh, tell me, we've been looking very briefly at the maple syrup, which of course we're here on one of uh, the maple farms. Tariffs are going to drop dramatically with this EU-Canada trade deal. Does that automatically mean good news for the consumers in the EU and indeed producers here? Well, it's certainly good news for producers here. Now, it's um, most likely good news for uh, the European consumer as well. Uh, we see an increased competition, especially for maple syrup, from the US. And since we have that uh, advantage of having that trade deal before the Americans, um, that will allow us to um, increase our market penetration and, and really, I mean, maple syrup, that's not American, right? It's Canadian, so. Um, and overall, in terms of agricultural produce, do you think this deal is a good thing in terms of a choice, price and food quality for, for Canadians? Yeah, we think so. Um, there's, a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of common ground, I think, between European consumers, uh, seafood and how we see our food as well. I'm not saying that we're happy about everything in terms of the trade deal, as I'm sure that it's not the case in, in Europe, but uh, you what know, you it's give and take. About? Well, cheese is a very sensitive issue, especially here in Quebec. Uh, for specialty cheese, it's 30% of our market. Well, actually, we sent our reporter Luke Brown to meet with some of the cheese producers here to find out what they think. It may not look like much, but this is the first stage of some of Quebec's most celebrated cheese. Jean Morin has been making cheese for 20 years, but the CETA deal throws a shadow over his future. Here is where we prepare the blue cheese. This is Elizabeth's Blue, which has won a lot of prizes, including best cheese in Quebec. All the cheeses here are threatened by CETA. Everything that's produced here in the dairy is on exactly the same marketplace as the imported cheese. Jean acquired the village church in 2015 to give it a new lease of life. He spent around a million dollars to turn it into a cellar for his best-known product. This space is good for aging cheese because of the humidity. Everyone used to complain about the church, that it was cold and damp. I said that it would be great for cheese. It's a bit of a paradox. We're here in a 150-year-old building, and we've also got this robot to turn the cheese. The Presbytère dairy can produce up to 100 tonnes a year, but the CETA deal will eventually allow 18,500 tonnes of European cheese into Canada, double the current amount. Quebec's cheese producers feel betrayed. They think they're being sacrificed in favour of other sectors of Canadian agriculture. Who's the winner of these commercial exchanges? It's not us. Our produce is being bartered away. My beef against your cheese. We're being sacrificed, and it's small cheese producers that are on the front line. The dairy here targets local-scale distribution, selling direct to customers who travel from across the province. The prices, though, remain high, around $35 a kilo here at the farm shop, and double that in the big cities. That's because Canada's cheesemakers face a severe handicap. Unlike in Europe, Canada's milk producers receive no direct aid. To keep prices high and guarantee farmers a livelihood, the production is deliberately limited. Any external change could upset that balance. The European market isn't accessible for us. First, the value of our raw material is nothing like that in Europe. That means if I want to export to Europe, I'm just not competitive. Milk costs twice as much here as in Europe to make identical products. Olivier Tourette sees a more positive aspect of the CETA deal. 
He's a French cheesemonger about to open a new boutique in Montreal to sell both European and Canadian cheese. He thinks CETA will mean more choice on both sides of the Atlantic. We find the same kind of cheese in France, but we really didn't have much experience of cheese from Quebec. I think CETA will be very good to help us to get to know more about the cheese from here. There's no need to fear the invasion that's being talked about. On the contrary, it could save the sector. It'll help bring new cheese production methods to Canada, and it'll open up consumers to new tastes too. For many small producers, though, that's over-optimistic. They say CETA threatens to destabilize a delicate ecosystem. Quebec is especially vulnerable. It produces over half of all of Canada's cheese and overall represents over 4,000 jobs. Of course, on the other side of the Atlantic, and we were looking at it briefly earlier in the show, the concerns over in the EU is that we're going to have an overabundance of Canadian pork and beef. And notably, uh, like you were saying for the speciality cheeses, the best bits of Canadian beef. We had one part of the EU, Wallonia in Belgium, that wants to put an emergency brake system in place if the market imbalance is struck. Do you think that's likely to happen? No, I, I don't think so. Um, well, first of all, um, there's a lot of uh, sanitary issues that needs to be uh, uh, resolved and our concern from our point of view is, uh, yes, we are going to gain some access to the European market, but is this going to be a real access? Europeans are not used to import outside of the EU. And so we're, we're seeing that this has been uh, an extra difficulty. It's going to take some time. Mr. Doyen, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thanks for your time. Pleasure was mine. Join us again after the news. When indeed we will be meeting Paul Magnet to find out more about uh, that specific issue and indeed how Belgium sees uh, this EU-Canada trade deal now.